Hi everyone and welcome to week two of Advent Adventures. This week our theme is peace. So once again you'll have a story, a candlelight ceremony, a craft related to peace and also some music. Enjoy! Hello. As part of our Advent series of videos, we are including the lighting of our Advent candles in a prayer. Before we start, I want to invite you, if you have one, to grab your own Advent wreath and light it as we go. Or even if you just have a candle to light as we make our way through this time together. As we begin, we relight the candle for hope, a reminder that hope persists through darkness and strife, encouraging us to face tomorrow. In this second week of Advent, we long for peace. But it isn't the same kind of peace that we find when we aren't at war, nor is it the same kind of peace when we are sitting on our own. It is a peace that comes from Christ, a peace that is beyond what the world can give. So let us light this second candle of peace together. Let us pray. We pray, O Prince of Peace, for a world that truly lives into your kingdom. In the birth of a single child, you offer us a glimpse of the trust you have in your people. The trust to live out your, the dream you have for this world where all people join hands in love, not hate, peace, not war. Guide our hands and feet to make that dream a reality. Amen. And God bless. This week, we're reading The Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey, written by Susan Wojciechowski and illustrated by P.J. Lynch. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy, but in fact, his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan Toomey seldom smiled and never laughed. He went about mumbling and grumbling, muttering and sputtering, grumping and griping, he complained that the church bells rang too often, that the birds sang too shrilly, that the children played too loudly. Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver. Some said he was the best woodcarver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting at a workbench carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. After supper, he sat in a straight-backed chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky, and you wouldn't see the dimple on his chin, since his face was mostly hidden under a shaggy, untrimmed beard, speckled with sawdust and wood shavings, and, depending what he ate that day, with crumbs of bread or a bit of potato or dried gravy. The village didn't know it, but there was a reason for his gloom, a reason for his grumbling, a reason why he walked hunched over as if carrying a great weight on his shoulders. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby had become very sick. And because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors, his wife and baby died, three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey had packed his belongings into a wagon and traveled till his tears stopped. He settled into a tiny house at the edge of a village to do his wood carving. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it. 
There stood a woman and a young boy. I'm the widow McDowell. I'm new in your village. This is my son, Thomas, the woman said. I'm seven and I know how to whistle, said Thomas. Whistling is pish posh, said the woodcarver gruffly. I need something carved, said the woman. And she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. After I moved here, I discovered that they were lost, she explained. I had hoped that by some miracle I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. There are no such thing as miracles, the woodcarver told her. Now, could you describe the figures for me? There were sheep, she told him. Two of them with curly wool, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow. And a cow, an angel, Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job? asked the widow McDowell. I will. I'm grateful. How soon can you have them ready? They'll be ready when they are ready, he said. But I must have them by Christmas. They mean very much to me. I can't remember a Christmas without them. Christmas is pish posh, said Jonathan gruffly, and he shut the door. The following week, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Muttering and sputtering, he went to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. Excuse me, said the widow, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and would like to watch you since you are the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. You won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in the far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight back chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still. Once, when he needed to sneeze, he pressed a finger under his nose to hold it back. Once, when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to twenty to keep his mind off the itch. After a very long time, Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, Mr. Toomey, may I ask a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided it meant yes, so he went on. Is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcarver nodded and grunted again. After another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but you're carving my sheep wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needle stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep. They cannot look happy. Mine did, answered Thomas. They knew they were with the baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times, then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife. He picked up the sheep. He worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Griping and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood the widow and her son. May I watch again? I will be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly, while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling raisin buns on the table. The teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea and a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat the bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could. 
but it is almost impossible to be seven and eat a warm, sticky raisin bun without making various smacking, licking, satisfied noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. Once he almost hiccuped, but he took a deep breath and held it till his face turned red. And once, without thinking, he began to swing his legs. But a glare from the woodcarver stopped him, and he kept them so still they fell asleep. After a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Grunt. Is that my cow you're carving? Nod and grunt. Another very long time went by. Then Thomas cleared his throat and said, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but I must tell you something. That is a beautiful cow, the most beautiful cow I've ever seen, but it's not right. My cow looked proud. That's pish posh, growled the woodcarver. Cows are cows. They cannot look proud. My cow did. It knew that Jesus chose to be born in its barn, so it was proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sounds that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click click of her knitting needles. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas shook first one leg, then the other, and he thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his carving knife. He picked up the cow. He worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair as he went to answer it. At the door were the widow and her son. May I watch again? asked Thomas. As Mrs. McDowell warmed the tea and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench, Thomas watched the woodcarver work on the figure of an angel. After a very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, is that my angel you're carving? Yes, and would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my angel looked like one of God's most important angels, because it was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important? asked the woodcarver. You'll be able to do it, said Thomas. You are the best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? asked the woodcarver. My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his beard, the woodcarver's face turned pink. The widow McDowell's face turned as red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What is your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I'm a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver. But he put down the important angel. You will carve a bird. A robin, I hope, said Thomas. I like robins. With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. He handed Thomas a small block of pine and a knife. He showed him how to lop the corners from the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the woodcarver's strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he concentrated. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of a wing. He didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas brushed wood shavings from his shirt. Then he reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shaving from Jonathan Toomey's beard. He thanked the woodcarver for teaching him how to carve. Later, after a supper of boiled potatoes and molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to his workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing. Finally, he picked up his carving knife. He picked up the angel. He carved until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. Mr. Toomey jumped up to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell with a bouquet of pine bows and holly sprigs dotted with berries. And there stood Thomas, clutching his partly carved robin. 
While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies, which she found in a drawer below the cupboard. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph, the woodcarver said to Thomas. Perhaps before I begin, you may tell me about all the mistakes I am going to make. Well, said Thomas, my wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus, and my Joseph was leaning over. Was leaning over baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. It wasn't until the church bells had chimed and the widow and her son were preparing to go that Mr. Toomey saw the jar of pine and the scrubbed table and the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. I found the cloth in a drawer. I thought it would look pretty on the table, the widow McDowell said, smiling. Never open that drawer, the woodcarver said harshly. When the two had left, Jonathan put the cloth away. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes, the woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He dusted the crumbs from his beard and brushed the sawdust from his shirt. At the door were the widow McDowell and Thomas. All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work. When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I'm about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how your figures looked? They were the most special of all, said Thomas. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother, and Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures will be ready? The widow McDowell asked. They'll be ready when they're ready. I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. That is exactly why we are giving them, answered the widow. She put them down on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand-knit, warm and bright. He tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin, crudely carved of pine. A smile twitched at the corners of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the fireplace mantle with his sleeve and placed the robin exactly in the center so he could look at it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it with the first. He sketched again. Once more, he crumpled the paper. Soon, there was a small mountain of crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat, staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells announcing the midnight Christmas service, he got up. Slowly, he opened the drawer beneath the cupboard, the drawer he had told the widow never to open. From it, he took the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. He took out a rough woolen shawl and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each piece gently on the floor. From the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame, beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. In the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a rocking chair, holding a baby. The baby's arms were reaching up, touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and held the picture against his chest. He rocked slowly, his eyes closed. Two tears trailed into his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench and began to carve, his fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. 
The next day, there was a knock on the widow McDowell's door. When she opened it, there stood the woodcarver, his neck wrapped in a red scarf, holding a wooden box stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the widow, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said as he stepped inside. From the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep, because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow and an angel, a very important angel, with mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. He unpacked three wise men wearing their most wonderful robes, edged with fur and falling in rich folds. He unpacked a serious and caring Joseph. He unpacked Mary, wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down, loving her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to touch his mother's face. That day, Jonathan went to the Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day in the churchyard, the village children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear as an August sky and laugh. And no one ever called him Mr. Gloomy again. Even though Jonathan Toomey has been through a lot of hard things in his life, he finds peace through his connection with other people and with God. Hi, welcome to week two craft. I hope you enjoyed the story of the Christmas miracle of Jonathan Toomey. It's a great story. It's one that I like to read every Christmas. Um, and it reminds us that we have to watch and look for those people in our community that may be lonely, or maybe for them Christmas isn't full of that joy that we feel at Christmas time. And we need to reach out to them and um, show them some of that joy of Christmas. So this craft is actually um, an easy craft. You don't need a whole lot of supplies. I went to the dollar store and I got this modeling clay and uh, actually it's quite fun, uh, fun to use. It's kind of relaxing when you squish stuff between your fingers. So modeling clay, dollar store, I think it is between $1.50 and $2 and it's got lots of different colors in here. And in the story of the Christmas miracle of Jonathan Toomey, Jonathan um, was making a nativity scene for someone and Thomas and his mom came to visit and Thomas um, was learning how to whittle and carve. So he was working on a bird while Jonathan carved the, the nativity scene. So um, you have a couple of different options here uh, and you can make as many things as you like. I made um, a little tiny black sheep might look like a dog. I'm not sure, but it's supposed to be a little black sheep and, uh, that, uh, maybe there was a black sheep in the, in the, uh, stable that, that first Christmas, who knows? But anyway, there's my little black sheep. You can also, if you uh, don't want to make anything really complicated, take your Play-Doh I'm going to try some blue. Maybe I'll make a blue bird. And uh, so you can take uh, your whatever color modeling clay you want and uh, make whatever you want. So maybe you're going to make a blue bird like Thomas in the story. Or maybe you're going to make um, one of the, the figures, maybe Joseph or Mary or maybe even baby Jesus in the manger. So you can decide what you'd like to make. I'm trying to make a little bird here. Now, um, I happen to have a little tool that can help me with um, carving, but if you want to make little marks in your Play-Doh, you could probably use um, a, a toothpick. A toothpick would work. So here we go. So here's my little bird. So I have this little tool. I'm gonna to give him some little eyes. I think his little beak should be a little bit. There we go, that looks more like a bird's beak. And you can even, if you want, um, mix some of the colors. 
so that, uh, yeah, you can make it uh, different color. So I can even mark in where his little wings are gonna be. Here's his one little wing. I don't know if you can see that yet. And maybe I'll make a little wing on this side. Yeah, so just be creative, have fun, make whatever characters you would like from either the nativity scene or maybe a little bird like Thomas was making. And uh, we'd always, always love to see pictures. So if you wanna take pictures of some of your great uh, creations, you can always mail them to the church and that would be kind of fun for us to see. Hope you uh, have fun with this craft and we will see you for week three. Stay tuned, bye.